again, welcome back to Think Tech. This is Keeping the World Company. And the question of the day is, have we completely forgotten about Ukraine? Uh, with my co-host, Tim Apicella, and our special esteemed guest, Gene Rosenfeld. Thank you for joining us, you guys. Aloha. So uh, let's start with you, Gene. Um, you know, what, what, what is it about Ukraine that differentiates it from Israel? And why is the, you know, speaker and the, I guess the Republican Party that follows him in the House looking to make that distinction? Well, there are two different answers. I mean, uh, Ukraine and Israel ostensibly are not related at all. In fact, if you uh, look at the whole picture in context, uh, who is invading Ukraine and why they're doing it and what their target is? Those are three questions we need to think about and answer. Um, why did Gaza attack Israel? Uh, what is their purpose? And why are we involved in it by sending warships and troops into that part of the world? And if you start answering those questions, you begin to see connections between these two activities. Um, number one, Russia is allied with the opposing side to our side in both conflicts. Secondly, the purpose of Hamas was to throw a spanner into the normalization process that we are invested in in pacifying the Middle East and creating peace and prosperity there. And if you look at Ukraine, Russia is throwing a spanner into the institutions of greater Europe that have developed since World War II under the aegis of American leadership and is then attempting to dismantle American leadership. So we see connections there. And then both cases are um, throwbacks to the kinds of war that we have not seen since World War II where there are high civilian casualties, much collateral damage, um, a lot of propaganda going out um, by our enemies to the world to try to convert world opinion to their side. Their ultimate purpose, I'm convinced, exists in Putin's mind, which is his vision of what he calls Eurasianism, the, re the um, renaissance of Russian civilization. Russia has become um, in despair about <clears throat> its uh, position in the world vis-a-vis -vis the United States and Europe. They're no longer turning to Europe. They are looking to expand Russian civilization, and they are in league with unaligned nations and trying to um, exercise hegemony over important parts of the world. So these two sensitive areas in Eastern Europe which recently freed itself from the Soviet Union and Russia's grasp, and the Middle East, which has been considered a tinderbox for 80 years, are logical places for Russia to expand and try to create chaos in order to show its power of leadership and to entice unaligned nations in its quest to basically overturn the Pax Americana and to introduce Russian values to the world. Yeah, well, you know, what's interesting is that in both cases, for the countries involved, it's existential. Um, what I mean is, uh, if Putin has his way um, in Ukraine, uh, there won't be a Ukraine, not a, and the people of Ukraine will, will be um, uh, subjected to Russian culture, influence, power, and so forth, or will have to leave. There won't be a Ukraine anymore. It, it's reminiscent of Stalin's attempt to starve the people of Ukraine out in 1933. It won't be there anymore. And it wouldn't surprise me if he tried, if Putin tried to starve him out now, if once he takes the geography. Um, and the thing with Israel, and this is um, the subject of um, Thomas Friedman's article in the Times this morning, uh, the borders of Israel are shrinking because the Jewish settlements um, don't want to expose their their members to all of the wars and north and, and south. And so um, where before Israel, um, as a matter of policy, always tried to keep settlements at the borders 
now the borders, now those settlements are essentially gone. And it isn't temporary because people are really afraid. And so Israel has effectively shrunk. And, and that suggests, at least in Friedman's mind, there'll be more shrinkage. And again, um, you know, from the river, the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea may, may become a reality. And uh, ultimately, if the borders shrink enough and the Jews are uh, so intimidated by all these other countries trying to destroy it, they may want to leave. You know, there are people who are leaving Israel for, for that reason right now. But, you know, you've shown, Gene, that there, there's a lot of connection, um, mainly Putin and Iran, um, between the, the two um, wars that we have going on, Ukraine and, and Israel. And I want to ask Tim, you know, um, gee whiz, uh, what's happening in Congress where that distinction can actually be made? Because it, it all seems so, so wrong to disconnect them when they are so connected. Mm -hmm. I agree with Gene wholeheartedly. I, I think all rivers flow to Putin. And um, in the plumbing industry, they have a term called backflow. And so all waters flow to Putin. And then the backflow is from Putin to Trump, from Trump to Mike Johnson. Uh, you have seen the support for Ukraine literally vanish, evaporate from the uh, mega GOP side. And now it's creeping into some of the GOP, the non-mega GOP. And uh, that's not good. That's not good for Ukraine, and that's not good for Europe, and that's really not good for uh, the world. So the support of Ukraine is essential, and we have an influence taking, t taking hold uh, from Putin, from Putin to Trump, from Trump to Mike Johnson, from Mike Johnson down to those uh, GOP that you know, want to get along. They have to go along, as Tip O'Neill used to say. Well, here we are. Time is of the essence, Tim. Um, unless we get some money to Ukraine, you know, a stalemate turns into um, a defeat. Sorry, I right. said that. Um, and, you know, the, 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 there won't be a turnover, even optimistically in Congress, until January of um, 2025. It's a long way off. It's more than a year away. And so, uh, uh, gee whiz, um, you know, what, what's your prediction here? Uh, assuming, even assuming optimistically that Democrats can take control of the House uh, starting January 2025, between now and then, you, you have the unhinged running the House and Trump running them. And Trump doesn't like Ukraine because he's friendly with our friend uh, Putin. He's always been um, strangely friendly with Putin. Putin has something on him. Who knows what it is? Someday we'll find out. But but the problem is that uh, assuming this comes from Trump and assuming it's going to stay the way it is between now and the election in November 2024, um, how can Ukraine survive? Well, the, the deadly word you, you mentioned was stalemate. In fact, um, <laughs> President Zelensky had to come out this week and say, uh, he had to countermand uh, one of his top military pe uh, people to say, we're not in a stalemate, um, because that's the last thing the GOP wants to hear, or even re Democrats want to hear, is that uh, we're in a quagmire in Ukraine and it's a stalemate. That means this is going to be an endless flow of funds uh, to, to, you know, wait out a stalemate. So Zelensky had to say, uh, it's not a stalemate. In fact, in some cases, we're not winning. And that's also kind of dangerous rhetoric because uh, the United States will want to make sure we back a winner and their initial year and a half uh, progress of repelling the Russians and making inroads uh, towards uh, freeing up some of the, the, the territory that Russia has taken has really incentivized the GOP to vote for continued funding. But uh, the word stalemate and or not winning, that jeopardizes support, I think. And that can't, and Ukraine will not win. They will not win this this drawn out battle if uh, the funding starts to trickle out. You know that was that was an interesting uh, moment where uh, one of his generals uh, said, uh, "We're in a stalemate," and then he corrected his general immediately. Uh, <clears throat> immediately, because he doesn't. You're right. It's it's a matter of uh, you know stating a position and not letting people abandon you, and so you can't use the word stalemate. Uh, too bad that that happened. 
But you know what? It tells us that the reality is exactly that. It's stalemate. And you're right. Uh, I think I think that that has an effect not only on the U.S. but other places. And speaking of other places, Gene, what about what about Western Europe? What about the EU? If the United States is being so, <clears throat> what do you want to say, unhinged? What about Western Europe? Are they still supporting Ukraine? Why don't they step up? Well, first of all, <clears throat> I wouldn't quite go as far yet as Tim and you are suggesting that Ukraine is in a stalemate. Zelensky just came out and said, no, we're not in a stalemate, number one. Number two, um, while all of this, the war is going on and everything else is happening, um, Ukraine is uh, progressing in its um, joining of the European Union. It is going to become part of the European Union and maybe sooner rather than later. So when it gets to that point, then you would expect members of the European Union to solidify their support for Ukraine. Because people who live in Europe understand the importance of Ukraine to Europe. Now, Ukraine is one of the largest countries in Europe. Whoever controls Ukraine controls a good part of the countries south of that, which are also members, some of them, of the European Union, and which also some of them prior to Ukraine were invaded by the by the uh, by the Russians by Putin's Russia, so they understand the importance the the fulcrum that Ukraine is. Set, thirdly, people have been floating a end game for Ukraine for a long time, and we have people doing business in Ukraine for after the war already. So we've got some investment there that is commercial as well as military and political. So, so the sense is not to lose Ukraine, but there may have to be a concession by Ukraine, ultimately. They may have to concede the east part of Ukraine, beyond the mm. river. Mm. And mm. I, they would not concede Odessa. I don't think they would concede Crimea, ultimately, but they may have to temporarily give up Crimea. But they're not going to co concede Odessa. So I can see the beginnings of an ending here. The other thing we need to know is that Ukraine is also employing mercenaries. There are um, former Colombian fighters who fought the FARC in Colombia who are signing up in Ukraine and other mercenaries as well. So the use of mercenaries cuts both ways in this war because Ukraine doesn't have the population to sustain a really long war. Does it have the money? It's got the support. It has the support of Europe. And it will continue to have the support of Europe so long as they join the European Union. But mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that all of Ukraine is going to be kept out of Russian's hand. <clears throat> to be clear, there's no Section 5 in the EU agreement, right? No, but there is a, a portion of it which, because Zelensky's membership there, since he realized that they're not going to get into NATO in time. Um, there is a portion of it that does call for support, mutual support. You know, uh, a week ago, Timothy Snyder wrote a very interesting piece. He called it, uh, we should be thanking Ukraine. Uh, they always thank us. We should be thanking them. And he had 10 reasons that we should be thanking him. And the one that stuck, the one he repeated only a couple of days ago, was that they're fighting our war. Um, this is all for us. And it, if, if they weren't fighting our war, we would have to put boots on the ground. And that includes Western Europe. They would have to put boots on the ground. Um, so is this, this notion of they are fighting our war, is this still as persuasive as it used to be? Is Western Europe thinking that thought? Um. I feel Zelensky said this right at the outset that Russia that um, Russia is really aiming at the West and aiming at the United States. And I agree. Putin has made very clear in speeches he's made recently in international forums and in his behavior um, that he he really wants to wrest the control of global leadership away from the United States 
and put it into Russian hands. And this is a, a, um, a strategy called Eurasianism, which he's, he's bought into for quite some time and the Russian people are behind. They elevate Russian civilization. They, they exaggerate their importance in world history and they're ready to be spoilers. They, their sense of values is different from the United States. And they're talking about something called multipolarity, which is double speak for hegemony by Russia and China. Mm -hmm. But very enticing. Their narrative is very enticing. And for this reason, too, I think that Europe is wise to this. Europe is already combating proto-fascism inside of its own countries. Hungary is a case in point. And um, it is elected. And Belarus, of course, has gone over to the dark side. And it's happening in the United States. You you ask why is uh, why are the Republicans doing this? Because the MAGA movement is essentially a movement much like the ones internally in Europe, which would like to introduce uh, ultranationalism into their countries, withdraw from global engagement, except when the need is to defend themselves or to aggress some other country, and bring us back to the 1930s again. Well, that's where we've been, you know, Tim and I have been studying that for five years, and it's always appeared just that way. We're bonded at the hip with Rachel Maddow. Um, so, so, Tim, let me, let me go to the real politics side of this. Um, the, the Republicans, uh, through uh, Mike Johnson, uh, have said, A, um, no money for Ukraine, no weapons for Ukraine, and B, what's worse is that uh, for Israel, um, they want to take the, the cost of defending Israel out of the budget for the Internal Revenue Service, thus improving the prospects um, for the 1%, you know, to have an even better tax break. Um, is that going to change? Uh, why should that change between now and the end of uh, 2024? Um, because I think there's enough Americans that support Ukraine. I, I, I think there's a lot of Republicans, non-mega. Uh, I, I like to call them the good old-fashioned Republicans, the ones that I, I used to be the, belong to that party. Are, are you? But are you talking about the electorate, or are you talking about I, I'm Congress? talking about both the electorate and in Congress. Um, yeah. I think there's enough House representatives, even though Donald Trump wants to, you know, slam his fist on the table and say, you know, you vote all one way or uh, I'll, you'll bear my wrath. Uh, I think there's enough that will stand up against Trump and Mike Johnson say we want to support Ukraine, either by weapons or by dollars. And if that doesn't happen, um, guess what? President Biden could pull a Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He could pull a, a, a Lend-Lease program to Ukraine. Well, I think he, he is to some extent right now. He's, he's doing it on the proclamation basis, you know, without seeking congressional approval. He's somehow doing it. Um, you know, that's... It's it's really a problem. But let me let me ask you this: um, Biden Biden hesitated on giving Ukraine, you know, jets. Uh, he even hesitated on giving permission to other countries who have our uh, fighter planes from giving the fighter planes to Ukraine. He really made it hard for them to control the skies, and they still don't really control the skies. Uh, so the question is. Um, does he look strong or weak for doing that? Does he look strong? Uh, does he look strong or weak for for handling not only Ukraine but Israel in the way he has? And could it be that if if we lose in Ukraine, if Ukraine loses or Israel, you know, is is damaged further uh, and doesn't have a way out, um, is that the end of Biden? Let me go to the first part of that question. Then is I think. I understand where Joe Biden's coming from on his hesitancy to send those long range missiles, missiles to Ukraine or um, the latest and greatest in uh, air weaponry. But he's worried and has been worried that Ukraine will go too far with it and, and do strikes within Russia, inside Russia. Isn't and it already that, doing that? Aren't uh, we well, already they're doing in... strikes within the Russian portion of Ukraine, but not inside Russia. Mm -hmm. And the bottom line is, um, and Ukraine has, you know, gone inside Russia, of course. And, and so his, his fears actually might be well confirmed. Uh, obviously, he looks wise and strong to say, I want and try to uh, avoid a World War III. I don't want NATO involved in this, this conflict. 
And how much easier is it to get involved in this conflict when there's going to be direct strikes using U.S. warplanes or U.S. long-range missiles? Uh, he would have to trust Zelensky uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt to just say, take them all, um, which now he's committed to. But that's his hesitancy, and I think it was well-founded. Uh, you're, you're talking about the logic. I'm talking about the politics. Okay. Is the country going to see him as strong or weak if he somehow loses Ukraine and or Israel? Politically, he's finished. That's my answer. What about, <laughs> what about you, Jean? Do you agree with that? Well, ha, nobody. <laughs> <laughs> He's toast. <laughs> Russia keeps stressing us. Um, the, the purpose, the, the overriding purpose of the president of the United States is to do what's best for the United States, to preserve national security. And I believe that's what Joe Biden is doing. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many other considerations that he is privy to that we are not. They cannot appear on the on the on the pages of the newspaper. Our generals have hotline to Russian generals. Our um, people have uh, hotlines. Our, our CIA head of our CIA is in Qatar right now talking to Hamas. There's so much more data they have in terms of the danger. You know, we can look back historically in the Kennedy period and see how close we came to war. We couldn't do that then. So we must have come pretty close to war with this foray into Ukraine to give the president pause not to, um, not, not to attack the Russian bear in any way, shape, or form. The other thing that I have read recently is that initially, Biden thought that Zelensky was not long for this world, that he couldn't, he could, you know, he, first of all, we thought Ukraine was not going to exist after four or five days, but for a lot longer than that, the United States wise guys thought that Zelensky wasn't going to survive. And Biden and Zelensky had to come to an understanding. Zelensky had to show that he was going to be there for a while. And Biden had to be sure that Zelensky wasn't a wild man. He didn't have much political experience. You remember, he's an entertainer, basically. He had played the president, but he'd never been the president. Uh, that he would have the wisdom uh, not to push things too far with Russia. So now they are able to understand one another. Zelensky is still in place. I think that Zelensky is probably intransigent on uh, negotiations with Russia and is still saying they're not going to give up an inch of Ukraine. That, of course, that in real politic doesn't mean anything more than a promise because circumstances can change. Existential circumstances can change. Biden has been giving him more powerful weapons, giving him fighter jets, training them. I'm sure we have advisors in Ukraine who are interacting with the Ukrainian military. And Zelensky has been cleaning out his military leaders. He's been getting rid of a few of them. So we don't know the whole story as to how it looks to the people of the United States. Um, Biden has to be able to control the narrative on the pages of our newspapers and our screens. And that will determine if there are no huge missteps, if there are no big black swans, he will prevail. That You see, he's fighting on two fronts. The purpose of our uh, enemies, uh, the enemies of the United States in Ukraine and the Middle East, is to dump Joe Biden, to get rid of Joe Biden, because he's effective. He works. He gets it done. And he's got world, he's got more prestige out of the United States, outside of the United States, than he does inside the United States. And their whole purpose is to upend the United States. Now, we need, the Democratic Party needs to campaign on that. They need to bring this out. And they need mm, to, to yeah. they need to know that, that our internal enemies are also our external enemies. Uh, unfortunately, in, in, in the land of isolationists, people don't necessarily see those international issues. And uh, the press has got to educate them. And the press isn't really doing that. 
You know, if you look at uh, our favorite MSNBC and CNN, um, you know, it it really doesn't do that. Neither one of them do that. Even the BBC doesn't do that. So let's let's go to Israel for a minute, Tim. Okay, um, you know, I think it, it's interesting that uh, when you have leaders in desperate situations, you necessarily you can't necessarily uh, trust them. Uh, they may be using weapons in, in, in ways you didn't like, didn't agree on, um, and uh, they may be doing things that, uh, in terms of both the rhetoric and and, and the, uh, the strategic um, developments of the wars. Um, are really not in our interest, or for that matter, their interest. And so, um, you know, we 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 see now uh, under Mike Johnson an attempt uh, to um, uh, an attempt to provide funding and weapons to Israel, but it's it's got kind of a, a wrinkle to it in terms of cutting the funding for the Internal Revenue Service. And that may be um, a poison pill, if you will, that stops that legislation uh, in the Senate. So um, with the Democrats. So query, do you think that's going to get through even as written? I personally don't think it will get through. Um, why do I think that? Is just because it just really puts a spotlight on the GOP party that they're trying to preserve and protect. Um, a favoritism of the one percent uh that's not a good narrative and it's painfully obvious to associate funding irs uh, collection abilities to uh funding israel and they're just they don't belong together as a package and i think i think it'll actually would hurt gop in 2024 uh if that were to succeed well it leaves it, it leaves it open uh you know we we're only a few days away from the uh, the defunding uh, issue, uh, what is the 17th? It's just a few days away. And we're not making any progress on that. And query, are we going to make any progress on funding either Israel or Ukraine uh, in, in time? In time. Well, because we, we always go, we always put our toes right over the edge of the cliff before a settlement's made. So I, I don't expect anything different just in the next, what, seven days? Um, yeah, one of our, the nation's foot will be over half of that cliff. Uh, the other foot will be on land, and in the end, it'll, the other foot comes back onto land, and we, we settle up. Uh, mm, but I, I, I love when you're optimistic. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> Gene, one of uh, Thomas Friedman's points, which is, um, you know, really profound, is the uh, only way Israel will survive um, and be a good partner for the U.S. Uh, is is with the end of Netanyahu. Uh, he hasn't been a good partner for Biden at all. He hasn't listened to him, and his rhetoric has been really awful. Um, and so uh, Friedman's saying that the magic solution here is getting getting rid of Netanyahu. On the other hand, you know you worry about getting rid of a war a war leader in the middle of the war. That's doesn't sound like good policy in general. Um, query, one, should Israel, for the benefit of Biden and itself, get rid of Netanyahu, assuming that is doable? And two, what are the, what are the details of that? <laughs> Must it be a, a voluntary departure? Can it, will it have to be an involuntary departure? And what, what kind of characterizations the Israeli government make to the people of Israel, to us, and to the Arab countries uh, to explain and and have a benefit out of the transition? Well, Netanyahu has never, I think, I can say this safely now, never really been in favor of a Palestinian state. So if this is going to be a solution, if, if the war in Gaza is going to come to an end, there's going to have to be a Palestinian state because that's what every other party to this war is saying. And it also, I think, uh, there's no other end game that will make sense for Israel 
so that they can be safe in the future. They have to do something different this time because everything they've done in the past has led to the same result, which is an escalation of hostilities in this uh, low-level war that's been going on for 18 years since Hamas got into power. There have been rockets falling on Israel for 18 years. People don't understand that either. So in order to make things different this time, yes, uh, Netanyahu will have to make a concession or Netanyahu will have to go. It, not now. I mean, not quite yet. But if he can survive this war, he will be doing something that Golda Meir could never achieve when she had <laughs> and she was far less culpable than he in <laughs> producing the consequences and being surprised. So. I think that the Israelis right now are incredibly united. It doesn't matter what their politics are anymore. Every Israeli that I've heard speak has remarked that they are all hugging one another. And they're all, they're all in, this, in the same place. They're not going to be united to get rid of their war leader right now. But in terms of who is going to put together the end game, it's not going to just be Netanyahu. And if he's the only fly in the ointment, at some point when Israel has military superiority over Hamas, he will go. So, Tim, you know, we have a, a real issue in the United States. It's almost like, um, you know, the Arab narrative has, has pervaded. And there are all kinds of protests, and they continue. And uh, to some extent, they get violent. Uh, one man was killed in Los Angeles a few days ago, um, a, an old Jewish man, as it were. So what effect does that have on Joe Biden's moves, on Israel's moves? Uh, because there's an awful lot of people just complaining about Israel, complaining about the war, denying now the latest thing is they deny the massacre took place. That's my personal favorite thing. Um, and so what you have is misinformation. Somebody, uh, parentheses Putin, uh, it wants to spread mis and disinformation around this country and have people support Hamas, which some people are doing. And so there's a lot of confusion, misinformation, misunderstanding, ignorance happening not only on the college campuses, but elsewhere. Mind you, by the way, let me add, that never happened, not to the same degree, around uh, Ukraine uh, or about the war crimes in Ukraine. Never. Um, but here we have all this uh, protest about, about Israel. Um, what are your thoughts about how all of that, uh, in every major city, in every major campus, um, how does that affect Biden's decisions? How does that affect the government's decisions in Congress? Well, I think it fortifies President Biden's decision to support Israel. Uh, but remember, there are a lot of um, Palestinian communities in some of these swing states. And there is a vow that because President Biden has supported Israel so strongly that uh, they will not either turn out or they'll vote against President Biden. Um, that's a little disconcerting because, uh, be it Michigan, where a lot of uh, Palestinian uh, people live, uh, that you live here in the United States, um, Michigan's a very important swing state, and uh, it's needed. And if if this 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 war has um, detracted a lot of voters for Joe Biden, um, that's not exactly positive. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're almost out of time. Uh, so, uh, Gene, could I ask you to? summarize and leave your takeaway with our viewers and take a minute or two. Even though Ukraine is off the front pages of our screens and our newspapers, things are still happening with Ukraine. They still have monetary and military support. They are uh, incorporating into their army mercenaries from other countries and sympathy with them. Uh, they are uh, making strides in joining the European Union, which is a mutually supportive institution, and joining Western Europe. And uh, I feel that Ukraine may have to give up its eastern provinces to Russia in order to keep Odessa and perhaps maybe even Crimea.
but uh, the United States is still very invested in Ukraine as a major European country and the breadbasket of Europe, if not Africa as well. So I feel that we don't need to give up on Ukraine quite yet, but I also feel that Ukraine, especially its leadership, Zelensky is getting very tired. I mean, how, how can they withstand all of this for so long? Their military, the, the soldiers are getting very tired, but they are powered by the most, you know, powerful motive in human history, which is to keep their own land and their own people and their own identity. So I don't feel too pessimistic about Ukraine just because the war in Gaza has captured uh, our attention. Insofar as the war in Gaza is concerned, I think it's going to end sooner rather than later. I think that the uh, IDF is gaining military superiority over Hamas. And now the more difficult job of what they're going to do to um, bring a close to this in a just way is on the plates, not only of the Israeli government, but also of world institutions and the Middle East powers that want normalization. They want to return to no normalization. In order to do that, they have to solve the, quote, Palestinian problem mm -hmm. by figuring out how the Palestinians will achieve some degree of self-determination in their own land. Wow. Complicated. You wish that there could be one room where they all get in that room and settle up on both of these wars. Tim, uh, your last comments? My last thoughts are I completely agree with, <clears throat> excuse me, Jean, and that is uh, Ukraine, President Zelensky is going to have to concede territory to Russia, and it probably will be parts of, of Crimea. And I agree with her that the jewel of the Black Sea for Ukraine, uh, that will be, they won't, they won't concede that over to Russia at all. Um, that's a huge importance for export of all their products and grains. And um, that will, I think Zelensky will not agree to that. But President Biden at some point and other world leaders um, have already had these conversations with the Zelensky we're just not privy to them. And that is, um, this isn't gonna go on forever. Uh, American support is waning and something's gonna have to be done very quickly to, um, and it's a, it's a compromise both Putin and Zelensky won't like, but there'll be some sort of settlement as Gene suggested. Um, that's my hope because otherwise uh, the independence and sovereignty of Ukraine will be lost uh, and particularly that will be determined by the who's elected president of the United States in 2024 and then takes office in 25. And if it's Trump, um, all bets off. My comment is uh, if you go to the 100,000 foot level and you look down at all this trouble, you say, uh, aren't these people aware that climate change is our number one priority? Why are they, why are they doing this? And shouldn't they be working on climate change instead? How about that? All right, Gene. Gene Rosenfeld, uh, Tim Apicello, thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Aloha. Aloha.